Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. In our last video, we discussed about batch normalization. In that video, I have introduced the problem of internal covariate shift and why do we need batch normalization in detail. So you can watch that video before coming here if you want to have clarity on why do we need batch normalization. In this video, we will see actually how batch normalization works with an example and then we will see what are the parameters in the batch normalization, everything in detail. So before going into the topic, I just want to have uh, you guys a bit clarification about two commonly used terms, normalization and standardization. When we say batch normalization, it is not actually normalization we are doing, we are actually doing standardization. So this is the difference between them. Normalization is kind of taking maximum and minimum and then scaling the values between them. So automatically your values will be ranging between 0 and 1. So this is like you are normalizing with respect to the maximum and minimum value. Every value you are normalizing with respect to max and min. That is what actually normalization means. Whereas standardization is actually to make mean as 0 and variance as 1. This is exactly what we are doing in batch normalization. But the term being used is commonly normalization. But the actual thing happening is standardization. Okay. So we use these terms interchangeably but there is a difference. So with that let's have a quick recap of our previous session. It is a common practice to normalize the inputs of ML model. So we are saying whenever you build a neural network model or machine learning model, you, we usually normalize the inputs before passing to it. Why do we need to do that? Let's suppose that you have this neural network, okay? It is taking two inputs. Suppose that x1 is in the range of between 0 and 1, but x2 is in the range of hundreds, like let's say 100 to 200. Let's suppose that you have one more input here. Let's say that is x3 and x3 is in the range of minus 10 to plus 10. So these are the ranges of your inputs to this model. So obviously we know that all these three are in different ranges, right? So when you pass these things to the model and every input is going to multiple neurons and for every neuron, all the inputs are coming with some weights. If you take this particular neuron, your x1 is coming, x2 is coming, x3 is coming. All of them are coming here right? So as these are different scales, it is a bit difficult for this particular neuron to learn these features because they are maintaining at different distributions, right? They are maintaining different distributions. So it's a bit difficult for this neuron to learn this. So that is why usually we normalize the inputs. Now let us come to this. When we don't have normalized inputs, when we have unnormalized inputs, usually our contour plots look like this. So your cost function depends on weights and biases and the cost function Actually, the contours looks like this when you have unnormalized inputs. So it is a bit difficult now to convergence. I took this uh, slide from Andrew Ng, uh, this one course. So you can see these three inputs, even he is saying the same thing. So x1 is in the range of 0 to 1, let's say, and this is in minus 1 to 1, and this is 1 to 2. It is very different. And same way here, x1, let's say it is having range of 1 to 100, whereas x2 is only 0 to 1. So if you have these kind of variations in your input, your contour plot actually looks like this and it is very difficult to converge to a local minima or a global minima for this thing. When we normalize it, usually all of these things will come into the same range 0 to 1. It's not 0 to 1, it's minus 1 to plus 1, minus 1 to plus 1 because it's a unit variance and 0 mean. So when we have that, it actually converges. The circles back actually it becomes like this. You can see it is very easy for traversing through this error contour and then it is very easy to converge. So that is the reason we normalize the inputs. Okay. That is what we are doing. Let's say this is my input. We are doing the scaling here. Scaling in the sense you can say normalization. So whatever you call it. So it is passing through this particular layer and it is kind of creating this is intermediate representations or you can say activations, right? Now these activations are getting passed to the second layer. We are doing the scaling here or normalization here. But what about here? For this particular layer, this is my input. So it doesn't matter what we are doing here. This is the actual input going to this particular layer. So if this layer also has some weights and biases and it needs to learn properly, so this also has to be normalized. That is the reason we went for batch normalization, right? Otherwise, the activations actually, they keep changing if you don't normalize. That is what it is, internal covariate shift is. So this is my k-1th layer and kth layer. So these are intermediate hidden layers. Now, if the distribution is this one, right? After I updated the weights, after weight updation, after the back propagation, one iteration done, now the weights got changed. So because of which your activations will get changed and your distribution also changed here. 
Now previously it learned this distribution. What should happen in this layer, right? In the kth layer, it learned this distribution. Now after weight update again the distribution changed. Now what should it do? It has to again adapt to this distribution. So like this again the third time weight weight update happens. So this process continuously happens for every weight update the distribution might change, right? So when these distributions changes, it is a bit difficult for this layer to learn properly. That is what internal covariate shift. So the distribution of hidden layer changes. Now to solve this, we have batch normalization. So that is nothing but you add this kind of normalization even for all the intermediate layers. That is what exactly batch normalization is. So if you say this as the layer k, now this is going as input to layer k plus one. So this is layer k plus one. Now. Out of this layer K, I am getting some activation. Okay, this is activation. Now this activation, what I am doing actually in batch normalization, I am calculating the mean of it. So this mu is actually the mean, mean of the batch, and then standard deviation of the mini batch, and then this scaling and shifting operations. We will come to these scaling and shifting operations. You can see that these are the parameters to be learned. Why do we need this? We will come to this. For now, you can actually ignore this. Okay. Just ignore that part. Assume that we are only doing this here. So we are take calculating the mean of the mini batch and standard deviation of the mini batch, and we are normalizing these inputs or standardizing these inputs. Now, once I did this one, this will be actually zero mean and then unit variance. Now this will go as input to k plus one layer. This is what we have seen previously also in the last video. So this is how exactly it works. Now I am saying the mini batch here. Right. So, what does it mean to me, mini batch? Because usually this is one activation for one particular node in your layer. Okay. So, like this one node is there. So, one node output is x. Is this only single value or is this is having multiple values? If I want to calculate the mean, it should have multiple values, right? So, that is what mini batch is actually. Because x is having a mini batch, that means that it has multiple values. So we'll see what is batch and mini batch. This is batch. Let's say you have this training data set, and this n is let's say thousand samples. Okay, so n is thousand samples. Now all these thousand samples, if you take at a time in a single iteration, you are giving to the model, and then you are computing the gradients and updating the weights. That's it. Done. This is actually batch. So it is a single thing. There are no multiple batches. It is a single batch. Okay, all the data set. Now Tell me one thing: Do we need batch normalization here? Do we need batch normalization here? Because the weight updates are happening only once, right? It is happening only once. If weight updates are happening only once, there is no internal covariate shift. The distribution, whatever these internally the model is learning, that is only one-time activity, depending on all the inputs it has seen, right? So you don't need batch normalization actually when you are having a single batch. But this we need when we have mini batches, multiple batches. You can see this. This is batch number one, batch number two, like this. Batch number some x. So if it is n elements, and each element here, example in this example, two elements are taking in one batch. So usually this is batch number one, batch number two, like this. We have n by two batches. So that means like 500 batches we are having if n is thousand. Now in this case, first only two elements will go, and it will go to this iteration one. It will compute the gradients, update the weights. Now the distribution change happened in the hidden layers. Internal covariate shift. It happened now. Now when the second batch goes, now the distribution got changed here. So in this iteration two, it has to learn the new distribution. Again, it will compute the gradients. It will update the weights. Again for the third batch, again it has to update. So here is where we need batch normalization. We don't need batch normalization here. We need batch normalization here. And these are called mini batches. Because it is not a single batch, these are small sol mini batches. Why do we need mini batches? There are many reasons. One thing is, if your data set is huge, loading everything into RAM, it is difficult. That is one reason you split into your data set, right? We are doing usually when we do training, we usually use mini batches, not a batch. So we call it as batch normalization, but it is actually mini batch. So that is what it is happening here. So if you see. This x is an activation from the previous layer, some some layer, intermediate layer, over a mini batch, and this batch is having let's say m elements. This n can be ten, twenty, depending on your batch size. Now for these m values, what we are doing is we are calculating the mean. You can see for all the m values, it is summing and then 
taking dividing by m so this is mean calculation and then this is variance calculation and then this is the standardization or normalization process where you are subtracting with mean and then dividing with standard deviation that's why you need square root why do we need this epsilon this is only required in the cases where this can be zero let's say if your this is zero then this is this becomes like this expression becomes 1 by 0 which is not possible so to avoid that we add a small constant called epsilon that's it and then scale and shift we will come to the scale and shift for now you assume that till here only we are having batch normalization okay and this is going as input to the next layer fine so this is batch normalization if you want in visual details clearly let's see this one so let's suppose that one of my neuron has three inputs so the batch is having three elements so now these three elements it should go to a particular weight values and then it will give activation that is what happens here these inputs goes through the weight values and then after multiplying this this actually is x1 w1 and this is x2 w2 and x3 w3 when you do this one you will get this one so this is x1 w1 this is x2 w2 and this is x3 w3 so these are your activations now these are your activations now these should go as input to your next layer and when it goes before going it we usually take it through the activation function so usually we call it as sigmoid activation function or relu whatever you want to use so this is an activation function and then you get the final output and this gets passed through your next layer so this is layer number k minus 1 and this is kth layer so this is k minus 1 and this is kth layer now this is going like this now batch normalization we will introduce here so here we introduce batch normalization now let us see how it happens with using these three we calculate the mean and standard deviation this is the mean calculation this is the standard deviation calculation here if you see we are doing this process even before the sigmoid function so this is what we are doing and once we get these values what we need to we need to normalize this z1 to get this value so what is happening here so it is actually z minus this mu divided by square root of sigma plus epsilon this is what happening here for every z value okay let's suppose i am keeping z i z1 2 3 like this and after that it is going to sigmoid so as i mentioned just ignore uh, scaling and shifting operations gamma and beta so directly now these are going to sigmoid activation function and then these are going to final whatever the outputs these are going to the next layer so this is kth layer this is going to the next layer this is what the batch normalization it is doing and this is your mini batch having three elements and this total operation it is for a single neuron so it is for a single neuron and the same thing happens for all the neurons in that particular layer if this particular layer let's say this is k minus 1th layer and this k minus 1th layer is having 10 neurons for every neuron this mini batch will have three and three elements and then this operation happens for every neuron and this is an example let's say these are my inputs okay here batch size is 6 and using that batch size i am calculating the mean value and then standard deviation mean sorry variance and then standard deviation here this is my epsilon value this is epsilon very small constant just to make sure that the corner cases of variance can be zero if your variance is zero then this will be infinite it is not undefined it is undefined so that is why now all these six values get actually converted into this usually this is mean zero and standard deviation if you see this one what is happening here whatever the normalized values here those are getting passed to this one activation function sigmoid activation function when you see this one most of them are the the actual distribution of this is actually this one this is the normal distribution right so if you observe here so it is having zero mean and then standard deviation of 1 so usually your normal distribution is 3 times your standard deviation it, it can distribute up to 3 times your standard deviation that's why it is showing like this now when you are passing these inputs to sigmoid function here right this z is getting passed to sigmoid when you are passing this so you can see the range is minus 3 to plus 3 usually so you can say the range is from here to here if you see it is almost straight line it is almost a straight line if you see this one so that means that because of this normalization whatever we are doing here even if we pass through sigmoid we are not getting any non linearity benefit because whatever the outputs coming from this one obviously they are following a linear pattern here 
it is following a linear pattern in this range. So there is no non-linearity here in this particular case because we normalize the inputs. Every input, every whatever the output coming from this layer, all of them are following the same distribution now. There is nothing new to learn by using multiple neurons. Even if you have 100 neurons in this particular layer also, all the 100 neurons follows the similar distribution now because of normalization. You understood the problem, right? See, it is the same thing. Like you are shown, like 10 people are shown the same point. So obviously they will learn the same thing. There is nothing new they are learning. So the similarly here, if your layer is having 100 neurons also, as you are normalizing it, all of them are following the same distribution here, normal distribution. So you are not learning much. Your learning capability of your model, the overall model is getting reduced, right? So this is the major problem. So we need normalization to remove the covariate shift, internal covariate shift, distribution changes, right? But when we normalize it, then it is losing the learning capability. What do we need to do now? Should we again get back to the previous one before normalizing? So whatever we have done here for normalizing, we should do the reverse of it to get some distribution like this. Should we do that? What about this? I am saying this is gamma and beta and this is scaling and this is shifting. These are scaling and shifting parameters. So now what happens? Is this not what is happening here? If it is the input to this, right, whatever Z, Z i here, sorry, whatever Z i here, that is your normal distribution with the zero mean and unit variance. And now when you do this scaling operation and shifting operation, it is kind of creating some other distribution here, right? Is this not what is happening? When we do this scaling and shifting, it will actually take your values which are having zero mean and unit variance and it will generate some real values. It can be of any range depending on your shifting and your scaling. So when you scaled it by some 100, so the all the ranges will become 100. Instead of 0, the mean will move to 100. So it can be of any distribution. That is the reason. Now this one actually enables the learning capability because this can be some other distribution. We don't know what it is. Depends on these parameters. So now this increases the learning capability. But what exactly, how it actually increases the learning capability? Let's see. If you see clearly here, we are having, let's say, some distribution here like this. Okay. And by normalizing it, you are making it like this. Okay. So this is 0 and uh, minus 3 to plus 3. Right. So this is 0 mean and unit variance. And again, by scaling it, you are again creating this some kind of distribution. Is this the reverse of this? This is scaling and shifting, isn't it? The reverse of this operation. So why are we doing this normalization and why are we again doing the reverse of it? So if you observe this one, right? If my gamma is equal to sigma and my beta is equal to mu, if these are equal, then obviously my Z cap, whatever I'm having, it will be equal to Z tilde. Isn't it true? This is true, right? If these are the same operations, both are equal. If this is equal to this and this is equal to this, obviously we are actually again getting back the same distribution. Whatever it is having here Z, then this, this is equal to the same thing. Sorry, this is not uh, Z dash. It is actually Z. Both are equal. Isn't it what is happening? So we are taking this here and then we are doing normalization and you are getting this distribution. And by doing scaling and shifting, you are again taking back. These both are same. But do we always get this one? Do we always reverse back to this? Because what I am saying here is gamma and beta are network parameters. These are learnable parameters. These are not something calculated values. These are learnable parameters based on the network. Now why do we need these learnable parameters? Because what happens in the network is, listen carefully, when you do this normalization and after that this learning capability it is losing, to add more learning, the network observes, okay, over the number of iterations, the network keeps observing the patterns of your distribution for that particular neuron. Okay, if this is my neuron, for this particular neuron, it will try to learn what is the actual distribution, what is the common distribution it is going towards. So it is not necessarily taking this reverse again by doing this one. Okay, it can be learning any other pattern. This will get clarified here. If you see, these are my network parameters, okay, learnable parameters. Now this is my input going to this particular scaling and shifting operation. This is zero mean and unit variance. Now this zero mean and unit variance, 
if my gamma and beta values are learnable it can shift this to this distribution or this distribution this one or this one it can be having any n number of distribution choices depending on gamma and beta and what it chooses whether it chooses this 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 what it chooses depends on the learning factor how the distributions are varying across different batches when you are seeing different training examples what kind of distribution are you trying to learn so depending on that these gamma and beta values changes and these gamma and beta values also learnable parameters that means these are learnable these impacts your final loss value or accuracy so that is why these are getting learned again during the back propagation now you understood right by using these gamma and beta parameters the network is trying to learn the overall distribution of your training data set right even though you are passing multiple mini batches and intermediately in between the iterations the distributions are getting changed but somehow using this gamma and beta it is trying to understand what is the overall picture at a global level out of my whole, whole training data set what is the distribution usually this particular neuron a particular neuron whatever wherever it is happening it is trying to learn so that is the significance of gamma and beta without gamma and beta batch normalization is of no use okay it is only doing some standardization with zero mean and unit variance but it is limiting its network learning capability okay so gamma and beta are very important parameters to make the network its own choices of distribution so because of weight update the distribution got changed somehow now the network doesn't need that distribution overall across the over the period over the time period if you see what does it mean by learnable parameters these parameters gets updated over multiple iterations over the whole training data set now as these parameters are getting updated for every iteration they try to fit a global view of your data set right so what is the out of my whole data set in the global level what is the actual distribution i want to learn that is what this gamma and beta will learn so that is the reason we need this scaling and shifting operation so as i was mentioning previously after doing this standardization using mean and variance you need this beta and gamma to again create a new set of values now these will go as input to your sigmoid function or whatever activation function now these will not be unit means unit variance or zero mean right so it will not be linear it will not fall under this range this is a different distribution it is learning so it can be of anything so it has non linear property that is the reason we need this gamma and beta values hope you understood why do we need this scaling and shifting so because people confuse that it might be just doing the reverse of this why do we need this but just one condition is these are parameters these are not some fixed values you are computing over some statistics these are network parameters these are learned parameters these can learn the actual inherent distribution of this particular neuron okay that is the reason we need these parameters so that is about batch normalization so we are taking a mini batch it's not a batch it's a mini batch so it's a subset of your whole batch now this can be any number depending on that number you calculate the mean of them this x is actually some activation for some intermediate layer now you calculate the mean of it and then variance you take the standard deviation and then you do standardization and after that once you get this one this xi you need to do scaling and shifting operation that is where you will get your final y so this is your final y whatever you want to pass it to your next layer this is what it will go to your next layer so this is what about batch normalization and how it works so obviously we have seen so far batch normalization these two are computed values over the batch but gamma and beta are two learnable parameters in batch normalization so just like every other layer batch normalization is also a layer and in this layer we have two parameters learnable parameters two of them gamma and beta scaling and shifting parameters so this is all about this video in the next video we will see the derivative of batch normalization layer back propagation how the training happens weight updates and how they happen for this gamma and beta parameters and then what happens during testing because for training you have a mini batch and you calculate the mean and variance here but in case of testing you might send only one image at a time or one one input at a time usually you might not have a batch then what happens over there so we'll see these details in the next video
Thank you.